you know, which is uh, typical, but that's okay. Um, there's, there's several kinds of barriers. The computers are not the barrier anymore. And data is getting much and much better. So the barrier now, the slowest reaction in this whole process right now, in my opinion, is people. And uh, those can be collaborators, and those can also be the general public. I'm going to focus on collaborators here. There's a separate talk, well, both for this, but also in dealing with the public. Um, and the fundamental, it seems, distrust of science the public seems to have. Um, and that's a, separate, that's a separate talk. So this is talking about collaborators. So what's institutional? Well, you have it here too, I'm sure. We have a silo approach to, to organizing. Right? We built a new building about seven years ago at LSU. And you know, it was on variety of committees. And I said, let's randomly assign people to offices. So they must interact with people. And that did not go over big. So now our physical oceanographers are in the second floor on the left. Our fisheries people on the first floor on the bottom. Uh, uh, and so we, we, we have still a silo approach. I do work with people in, in fisheries. Uh, and the only time on the same campus that we actually cross is at the provost level. Because they're in the ag school, and I'm, in, I'm not in the ag school. And that's just preposterous. That just doesn't make sense. Uh, funding agencies. It's difficult to get these funded institutionally. Because there's so much to put in that the reviewers always say there's not enough details. Right? And, in, and, and NSF and others are struggling with this. They want multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary projects. And then they go out for review to people in disciplines who say they, it's not good in my discipline. And there was recently a workshop about this, and it's tricky to do. It's so tricky that, uh, and this was quite a while ago, the Keck Foundation gave $40 million to the National Academies, which pales now that we've had the oil spill. But that was a lot of money back then. Um, uh, to bring about structural changes in funding organizations and academic institutions that hinder interdisciplinary science. I don't know about USF, but at LSU, we are always being told to work with others. Right? That uh, they're not really sure what that means, but we're always being told that. Uh, I like this quote from Werner von Braun, who was director of the Marshall Space Center. We can lick gravity, but the paperwork's a bit tougher. Right? Uh, this is, uh, people have started analyzing, and it's, kinda, it's been around for a while, though, authorship with these databases as a way to measure collaboration. So this is um, the mean number of team members uh, in social psychology, economics, ecology, astronomy. And you can see it's, it's been increasing. In fact, the one that wasn't was uh, producers of Broadway plays. Apparently, you can't have more than three. And then some, some ego happens. And uh, that's the only flat line they found, which was kind of interesting. Um, and then what they do is they go and model this in a very innovative paper. And they, they show the group structure, right? Who, who co-authored with who, right? So here's Galileo, Newton, Darwin, and Einstein. Crick and Watson. By the way, Crick and Watson shared an office for 40 years. They never had their own offices when they worked together. And the office was so narrow that if one wanted to get out to back up the chair, the other one had to pull in. And now we, I know we talk about space allocation and all that at LSU. I'm in charge of space. And you just think back about what some people did, right? It's, sometimes we, we, we lose track of the big picture. This is now the Genome Sequencing Consortium. So that really has changed, and that creates challenges. So what kind of challenges? Uh, things like, um, Mr. Osborne, may be excused, my brain is full, right? You can't know everything that you're now a co-author of. You just, it's, it's, there's too many high technology. I'm on a paper on stable isotopes. I still don't really understand how they work. Right? And yet you're, you're, you're going across disciplines and techniques. Right? So it's gotten quite complicated on, on how to do this. Uh, we need to get rid of email for that, for that purpose. It's terrible. E email's not good. You should check your emails more often. I fired you over three weeks ago. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten, I got an email from someone down the hall uh, asking me for my fax number so they could send me a fax. And I said, why? and of course I wrote back in an email that starts the whole thing, right? Why don't you come down and ask me? And then they write back, and you just go down this path. Uh, it's not healthy. Uh, 
this is a great book. I use it in my class. I, I teach a class on collaboration. And it's Overcoming the Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And I, I won't have time to go into it, but it's, it's really interesting to, to see. A lot of people think about this outside of our, out of our fields. One, one approach that people have used is complexity theory, which means the result is not the sum of the parts. So, and nonlinear responses, you may have heard of <coughs> chaos. So what does it have to do with this topic? Well, we do a lot of complexity theory in individual-based modeling. That is, we think if we add up all the individuals, we're going to get emergent behavior that's either nonlinear or not predicted from the individuals, right? Well, it turns out in education theory, they view a postmodern complexity of people as learners. So how we learn is not all at the same rate, in the same order, and with the same demeanor, right? There's nonlinearity. Sometimes you, all of a sudden you have a jump and a breakthrough. Other times you go backwards, right? Hopefully not too often if you're a student, but it happens, right? So we, there's a whole a psychoanalytical part of education that talks about how people learn. And my point is that scientists are learners, and we need to think of ourselves that way. So when we're working in a group with other people and other disciplines, we're, we're like in a classroom, right? Uh, we're not the expert anymore, right? So uh, there's been a lot about group dynamics in terms of, of patterns. So Adair had a very good evolution. He said groups to be effective have to form, storm, norm, and perform. And many people don't like the storm part. People finding their roles, knowing who, who's going to do things on time or not on time, who do you trust, who's going to be the naysayer. We'll never get it done. It'll never happen. If you've had courses where they make you work in groups, you know all these types of people, right? Other people have, whoops, have called them uh, uh, doers, carers, achievers, thinkers, leaders, monopolizers, the silent member, the saboteur, the habitual joker, the know-it-all. There's all been theories about how people have assumed personalities in a group. right? And we don't pay much attention to that as scientists, and, and we should. Because if you're going to work in a big group or a diverse group, you really need to be cognizant of that. So there's been a lot of those co-authorship type analyses, and one of the things we... I focus on is, is looking at individuals and how they learn, right? And so we're learners. And it could be challenging to us. And there's a psychoanalytical part here that says uh, someone who brings a new method to you or has results that contradict yours, uh, it's Freudian in, in a sense that it, it disturbs your internal stability. You don't like that. And you react in different ways. Sometimes it's denial. Sometimes you don't show up for the next meeting. Right? Sometimes you say, wow, I never thought of it that way. I do, right? and those are the moments you want to capture. You want to encourage those. Right? And so uh, there's a whole theory in industrial psychology. This is just one book, 16 Personality Types and Teams. If you know the Brig Myers test for your personality, so in my class everyone takes it, and then we try to figure out who's who based on that. It's very interesting. Some people get a little indignant uh, with some of the traits. But, but industrial psychology, IBM, Ford, they have all decided that if we're going to build a new product, do we have four teams of eight or eight teams of four? And who should be on it? It's not random, right? And, and um, they have very sophisticated ways of, of figuring out how people will interact in a team. And I think as, as scientists marching towards interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary work, like that end-to-end -end model, we should be more aware of those approaches and, and, and observe people as they are learners rather than experts. Uh, new unfamiliar knowledge can really, and it sounds kind of heady, but it can challenge your self-identity. It does. If you ever want to go, go to one of the Red Snapper public meetings. It's, it's, it's not even subtle, right? It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's all over the place, right? Uh, so, so I want to conclude now because it's, it's almost been... Uh, Almost been a, an hour. So I tried to squeeze three talks into one. I don't know if I was successful or not. But the first one was about a 3D individual-based multi-species end-to-end model, minus a lot of details, which I have a paper I can send you that's going to have more details than you ever want to see. Uh, all the equations, all the bookkeeping and everything. Uh, I finally sent the last one to Progress in Oceanography, and it was a 100-page manuscript. Um, and, and I don't recommend that. For students, by the way, break it up. Uh, uh, and I tried to, sh you know, it, it's, a, it's a different approach than Atlantis and others in that we really focus on two species in a lot of detail. 
but it's still going vertical, right, rather than food web. And it's built into the physics. I showed you how we can take a process that we did not understand how it was behaving when it was in the full-blown version, and we isolated it, built a new model to test it, and then <coughs> learned a lot and plugged it back in. Uh, the biology and people, not the computers, are the limiting information. And I'll tell you, the biology and data are getting better and better. It's really Im impressive, uh, the measurements. So that leaves us as perhaps the limiting reaction. And uh, I would just um, emphasize to you that when you're working in a group, d don't just kind of blindly go in and do your usual thing. Try to be aware and stuff of how others are reacting. Watch body language. So when I go into a meeting now, and, and uh, uh, the first 10 minutes, I don't even look at the speaker. I look at everybody else and how they're reacting to the speaker, right? And uh, I've gotten pretty good. I can, with, with a couple of hour meeting or something, I can peg a lot of people in their Briggs-Meyer traits because I can't remember the 16, how it maps. So I have to go back and look that up. But, uh, but, but it's an interesting way to think about doing science because... It's, it's going to be doing it more and more. And so with that, uh, I will end with this. Um, I wrote a paper. Again, I don't recommend this for students, but when you're old, you can get away with this kind of stuff. This was a paper, end-to-end uh, -end models, are we on the precipice of a significant advance or just putting lipstick on a pig? And I'm not sure yet. Uh, how we, if we take a bunch of models that didn't do so well by themselves and we glue them together, do we really think they're going to do well? On the other hand, if we take these models and we carefully weave them together and, and do it in a, in a reasonable and sensitive way, uh, we could learn a lot from that. And so I gave a talk in, in Spain, and then the journal said, would you put it? And I figured, well, nobody will ever find this one. In, uh, and the, but they do, it turns out, which the web is very good that way. So I, I got some emails about this one. Um, uh, uh, is food web theory and scientists, are we ready to do these kind of large-scale models? We're, we're going to find out soon. With that, I'll stop. Oh, anyone have any questions for Dr. Rose? <laughs> Feel free. Yes? That's the problem when you talked about the dynamics of groups like that. that yeah. Does it imply that people are discarding from, should be considered the idea of discarding people and then, of course, including other people? <sighs> no. I mean, it, a, uh, so so I, I'll give you the best example of that. So I, I get a lot of visitors, you know, because modelers are, we know a little bit about a lot of things, but we're an expert at nothing, right? So I'm always working with people. So I get a lot of visitors, and I make a point to bring them to the house because fundamentally it comes down to trust. Right? That's when you work well with people is when you trust each other. And trust actually is based on ethical behavior. And also having a connection. So I make sure I bring them to the house. right? And it, it really is surprisingly effective. But sometimes after they leave, my wife will say, how can you work with that person? <laughs> you know, it, you know, and, and I say, because they're good at what they do, they say they're going to do it, and they follow through. So you can't just pick nice people. You, you have to, right? That's not going to give you the best uh, result at the end. Yeah, because some of the ideas you were talking about seem to imply some cold-hearted efficiency uh, concept. It's, um, that's really up to the people who are designing the groups to take this into account. If, if you're a member of the group, you only have a couple of options, and one is to adapt to the dynamic of the group or to not participate, right? But to participate and be unhappy and feel inefficient is not, is not helping. But I think most of us are pretty tolerant of eccentric behavior. Um, certainly us in universities, uh, we, we, you know, we're, pretty, we're pretty okay about that, right? I can tell you when I worked in private industry, I didn't put up with most of that crap. That's just, it's not a, it's a no-go, right? It's very top-down, right? And, and you, you do it, right? Uh, um, but we're pretty, we're pretty easy-going group for the most part. We do have egos, though. And, uh, and you shouldn't try to change anybody, but 
but you should uh, figure out how you work effectively with them. Um, and by the way, if, if you're in a group and everyone doesn't like you, and you're in another group and everyone doesn't like you, you might look at yourself a bit. <laughs> yeah. I kind of relate to his question. So there's no like given actually, uh, personality type that like just shouldn't be in groups. Like you're always going to bring your group down. No, good, good question. So, uh, and again, I, I tried to squeeze probably too much in. But if you look at that mapping, every one of those 16 personality types has, has several roles that are very positive. You just have to know the roles. Right? And they also have weaknesses, but every one of them, in fact, the best group, they say, has a diversity of those personality types. Because if everyone's alike, they think alike, they act alike, it's not going to really be more than the sum of the parts. Right? So, and that's why some other people said friction is good. Right? Uh, it, it helps the group. Some tension is good. Right? That's the, um, that's the storming. Right? That a group that just all gets together and everybody's happy and then they walk away and then next time they show up is probably not going to be that effective. But too much is not healthy. Right? And so finding the sweet spot there is the, is the challenge. The first step, though, is just to be aware that people learn and process things differently. And so you might get frustrated with someone uh, because you've said this four times. Right? Every meeting. You know, we've had that before. Right? That's because they're working through it. And, and, you know, you have to try saying it a different way. Maybe pull them aside after the meeting and offer to, you know, you want to discuss this more. You know, you can do a lot of things to, to keep the group cohesive and, and going forward, right? Uh, as opposed to getting mad, and uh, which we all do at times. But, um, yeah? So there, there was one personality type I didn't see on your list. <laughs> a book came out a couple of years ago and identifying people known as diminishers. Oh, I don't know they, that one. They tear down everybody around them. Yes. Uh, that's a, it's a routine thing. And their recommendation from a corporate perspective yeah. was get those people out of the group. Fire well, them. Don't have anything to do with them. Um, I, I would have a little more positive twist on them. I would use that as an internal reviewer. So if you give them that role, and they're probably happy to do it, right? Uh, then, you know, maybe it can help the group by having them tell you everything you're doing wrong, and then, you, you know, you take that in from me. But sometimes it just, there are people who just can't work together, and they should not. Uh, it, you know, life's short. There's a lot of opportunities. So. I, I advise my students yeah. to um, kind of check their ego and be ready to, you know, yeah. look at the data, any new data that might contradict their own position, yeah. and be ready to... to Embrace it if they need to. Yep. So that's hard to do with an ego. You know, you've been publishing on something. And I, I wouldn't know. I don't have an ego. But <laughs> I hear it's hard, you know. Uh, what do you think about overall? The, is, is ego constructive or destructive? I think, uh, honestly, I think uh, uh, a, some ego is constructive. I, I actually think, I might get in trouble. Is this still on? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, I actually think a, a little bit of arrogance is good, uh, particularly in a group, uh, because uh, otherwise the loudest voice is going to win out. And that's not always the right answer or the best way to go. It, it's finding that the right balance. Right? The other thing is you have to be able to say, I don't know that. And the hardest one to say of all is, I was wrong. Right? But if you can do that with a sense of arrogance, <laughs> then that's, that is a healthy thing. And, and, and we've done that. You know, I, and you just have to say that. Uh, uh, you know, and, and then you go and you have a beer or you get a coffee. You, know, you, you, you make it so that it's not just this, this, this tension all the time. Right? It's very important to do that. I didn't think so when I started doing a lot of international stuff. Uh, I seem like they came all the way from Japan. Why am I taking them on a swamp tour? Right? I should, we should be working. And it turns out, no. You, t you take that time. You, you go to a crawfish boil. You know, this is Louisiana. You, you, go, you spend half a day on a swamp tour. And it's just so much more effective when you get back together. It, you can just feel it in the room sometimes. Um, and so it's that trust that 
that is really important to do it. Uh, yes, uh, well, if people need to leave, I understand. <laughs> Yes. Um, so it's funny, when you're looking at the ocean then, is it like a gradient between, you know, here's where one state's regulations take o takes over and into the other, you know, like state waters, or is it more of a line? Like, well, we... Like we here you have one right set of regulations, and here... We draw one. lines, mm -hmm. uh, but um, we, there, it turns out the fish don't know that. <laughs> um, uh, the, you know, the way it works is, is not bad, to, to, to tell you the truth. It's, it, it can work well. But but it is there's an arbitrariness in there. Uh, actually, I think and and Mike would know too. Uh, it's as much inshore offshore as it is. I mean, Gulf Coast now, as it is east west, mm -hmm. right? Where state and federal jurisdiction takes over because the fish don't really don't respect that. A lot of our fish do inshore offshore migrations, right? Mm -hmm. And so, state of Louisiana just recently broke their memorandum of understanding with the feds on. Red Snapper said, we're, we're not going to go with your closures. And so I, it, it goes in both dimensions. Well, um, I don't know where their state boundaries are anyway. Well, well, <laughs> <laughs> some say it was kind of a grab for the minerals underneath, but that, that's, yeah. a, that's another story. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, I got a question. Oh, oh, I thought you were trying to get me off. <laughs> no, uh, well, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> People are, if I may. Um, <laughs> something that everyone found novel and interesting, and so it's kind of dominated the question. Yeah. But if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a question yeah. about the, uh, the ecology. First of all, I, I was interested to see that I didn't realize <clears throat> that the sardine anchovy alternating uh, you know, regimes yeah. applied to other areas besides California. So that, that, that happens everywhere, does it? Yep. Uh, it's a little different in Japan because it's, a, it's, a, it's not an upwelling system. But it is, a, it is where two boundary currents meet. And so uh, and there's a third species involved there. So it's a little different in Japan. Oh, I see. Um, but the other systems are, are pretty much, well, there's other species there too. But, but they show those. Remember those? Those were landings. So you just have to be careful when we, when we look at landings. Um, there's a lot of economics that are intertwined there. But in general... These are relatively short-lived species, so, and, and everywhere but the California current, they're valued. Um, and so it, it does track some extent what the population's doing, because uh, if, if they can find them, they will, they will do that. Um, and um, you also, uh, so it sounded like that batch spawning gave you some, you uh, know, it's yeah. a difficult thing to predict. Um, but it didn't seem to me that you're using a, a bioenergetics model. Maybe I'm wrong. So how do you yeah. do that? So it, what we're using is, a, is a, called a DEB, a dynamic energy budget. So, so the fish consume using a...